251 kicks off a trend, Mr. Friends, where you work with classic characters not in their costume. Oh, please. Costume. None of them were, that was not my idea. Like, <laughs> none of that was my fault. <laughs> Superman was not my idea. Spider Man was not my idea. Even Thor was not my Thunder idea. Thunderstrike, yeah. I mean, even not, when even when my, he got on of, Thor, no, he was in the no, Walt Simonson armor. It always, it was always somebody <laughs> else's idea, and I was just sitting in the car with the engine running. I was the guy. I was the getaway driver. I was no. It was not my fault. Welcome back, everyone, to the Comics Cube. I am with the one and only Ron Friends. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing okay. My first question. The world is, the world is very happy. There's only one and only. Believe me. The world is very happy. <laughs> I have, my first question for you is, why comics? Why comics? Uh, I'd have to say I never seriously considered anything else. Uh, from the time I was very, 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 very young, uh, I've drawn. I, I can't remember a time when I didn't draw. Uh, and I was introduced... Well, as early as three or four, I was introduced to comics. Uh, I have a brother that's three years older, Randall. And the first comic we can, it, it may be, you know, pieced together. It may not be the actual truth. But the earliest comic we can remember being in the house is A World's Finest from 1964, mm. which would have been when he was seven and I was four years old. So he would have been responsible for it being there. Uh, that's the earliest one we can remember. And since the time I was, I don't know, I discovered Marvel through the cartoons. So by the time I was like six or seven, if you asked Little Ron friends what he wanted to do when he grew up, he would look at you in the eye and he would say, I want to grow up. I want to work for Marvel Comics and I want to dress Spider-Man. And at 25, that's what I was doing. So I was very directed. Uh, and it was never, I mean, I had parents, God love them, who didn't fill my head with the idea that it was a pipe dream or ridiculous or anything like that. I drew constantly. I copied from newspaper strips and copied from comic books. And, and uh, our folks were very supportive of our habit, you know, rather than a, we would do our whatever chores we had around the house, whatever we would do to help out around the house. We didn't really get an allowance. Our dad would pay for comics every I think we went out on Tuesday nights mm. to like three different places to like a, a sun drug, a national record mart and a newsstand and buy, buy comics. Of course, back then they were, they, when we started, they were only 12 cents uh, a piece. So it was less of a drain than one would think by today's prices. But yeah, we, uh, I was a comics kid. I, I loved comics from the time I was real young. And because I, Drew, I never really could, until I got to the uh, last two years of high school, I was doing a, a commercial art class, uh, half a day every day. And that teacher made me realize that, you know, you know, if you don't get into comics, you may wanna experiment with some other ways that you can make a living doing comics. So I opened myself up to the possibility of maybe a, you know, at that time there was still fashion illustration and there was still product illustration and there were, you know, so I opened myself up to the idea that maybe I'd have to get a job in an ad agency or something like that. Uh, and then I did two years at the Art Institute where I further experimented and played around, but I, I never really lost my desire that comics is what I wanted to do. Um, most of the projects, if, if I ever had an opportunity with any project, I would lean it back into my comics love, you know, somehow, one way or the other, I, I try to get it back there. Um, so when I graduated, I contacted, uh, I, uh, I was able to meet with Jim Shooter at one point, talk to him and show him my samples. He was very positive, but, you know, I, I sent the samples in by mail and they sat in a drawer at Marvel for about a year. In the meantime, I got a job at a local animation house that did uh, local and regional uh, animated TV commercials. Hmm. Uh, the things they did of note were the animation sequences for the two creep show movies and a, a, a video for, oh my gosh, my brain always lets me down in moments like this. It was Running Down a Dream. Who did the song Running Down a Dream? 
Uh, I didn't grow up there, so I wouldn't know. (laughs) Yeah, it was it was an an animated music video for. uh, uh, If I come up with it, I'll just yell it out. But okay, for for the song "Running Down a Dream," that's what the studio did. That would be of most inter you know national or international note. Otherwise, we did uh, local and regional uh, TV spots uh, commercials. But about a year after I sent in the the samples, I got a call from Marvel Comics, and they were interested in having me do some fill-in issues of KSAR, which led to, I turned them around fast enough that it led to other offers. And uh, about, I guess it would be about a year of, of doing other jobs. I, I did I did KSAR. I was a regular artist on KSAR for like, I don't know, six months or six issues. Uh, I did some Star Wars. I did some Indiana, uh, two issues of Indiana Jones. I did a King Conan, things like that, all for um, Louise Jones, who's now Louise Simonson, mm-hmm. all out of that same office while I was working at the animation studio. And that led to Spider-Man appearing in KSR, which got me onto Marvel Team Up, which got me in Tom DeFalco's office, which uh, got me the kid who collects Spider-Man, which got me Spider-Man. And when they offered me, uh, initially they offered me the, uh, six months of Spider-Man to uh, fill in for John Romita Jr. while he went off and got X-Men up and running. Um, when they offered me that, I figured, okay, I'm doing as well as you can do at Marvel. I'll uh, I'll go full time. So I, I at that point quit at the animation studio and went full time working freelance for Marvel. And uh, and you know I've been doing I I did that for thirty some years now. What a ride! Uh, yeah, yeah. I was under I was under contract for a while. The, uh, the last several years of Thor and Thunderstrike, I was under contract with Marvel. But when Thunderstrike was canceled and Marvel was having all the financial problems. Yeah, they didn't have any work for me, so I went over and did Superman for a couple of years, and and then that burned out, and I went back over to Marvel and did MC two with Tom DeFalco, and you know I've been bouncing around ever since. So, first of all, I I think it's really funny because um, I actually just spoke to Ron Randall a mm-hmm. couple of weeks ago. I find I find it funny that you have a brother named Randall. Yes. <laughs> It's just like, all of us. Like, well, oh. my, my, fa- my father's name is Robert William. Yeah. So he and my mother conspired to name us all RWF. I have a, a brother. My oldest brother is Robert William Jr. Uh, my older brother is Randall Wayne. I am Ronald Wade. And I have a sister named Robin Wendy. So and a couple of uh, my nephews have carried that on. Uh, and my brother carried that on. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of us RWFs running around, but yeah. But yeah. you were there born, you were born in 1960 and you just, I was indeed. Yes. You were discovered Marvel through the cartoons, which came out in 66. Uh, that would be, that would be, I think that's pretty much how it times out. My first, I think my first exposure to Marvel was, uh, Bozo's big top. Uh, here and locally ran the Marvel superhero cartoons mm-hmm. in syndication and the Spider-Man cartoon was already, it wasn't, I, I didn't discover it on Saturday mornings. I discovered it on a local station at seven 30 every morning or some mornings, my brother and I would eat our breakfast, getting ready for school and watch the Spider-Man cartoon on our old black and white set. Yeah. And, uh, I, I remember that being my first exposure to Spider-Man uh, and we had a friend a couple of blocks over who collected comic books and, and was already reading Marvels and we would trade comics with him and we would get, I, I got some early Ditko reprints and the first Spider-Man I remember buying off the racks wasn't until I was like seven. Uh, it was, um, uh, it was issue 60, issue number 60 where okay. King was swinging around by his ankles. Yeah, that was the first one I bought off the racks and uh, never looked back. But uh, but yeah, I believe those cartoons were my earliest exposure. We were Superman, Batman guys before that. You know, I mean, we were huge into the Batman TV series. We were the perfect age for that. And uh, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and before before the Spider-Man cartoon, there was the filmation Superman cartoon, the Superman Aquaman Hour of Adventure the Superman Batman hour, you know, that uh, so Saturday morning was 
all the Alex Toth, Hanna Barbera characters, uh, all those superhero characters were like huge for me and stuff, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was a typical kid, and I discovered all the same stuff that kids in that era were discovering. Yeah, what but, a prime I, age I, to be discovering. I thought so. I mean, but we all we all think, you know, and and I've I've come to discover that whatever whatever was being done in comics when you discovered comics those are forever going to be your favorite kind of comics. You know, for me, it's always going to be the late sixties, early seventies. You know, when I was yeah. like from six to 12, you know, that that's always going to be what a really good comic book is to me. And the same as the kids who were discovering it now. I mean, whatever they're reading now, whatever they first discover as comics, that's always going to be the very definition of a good comic book to them, you know? And, uh, it's always it's always kind of stuck with me that way. So I mean, I, I love that stuff absolutely. And the you know when you get on Amazing Spider Man, it's a backup. Mm -hmm. It's the kid who collects Spider Man with Roger Stern. Right. It's to this day, uh, it makes the list of like the greatest Spider Man stories ever. Yeah. How do you How about feel that? about that? <laughs> it's 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 an honor, but it's it's very humbling. Because I, uh, quite frankly, I, I truly believe this, that all I had to do was stay out of the way. I mean, Roger wrote an amazing story. I, I feel like I did the best work I could. I feel like I contributed somewhat to it. But you would have had to work really hard to screw that up. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, it would, uh, you know, any, any penciler that would have been assigned that, that would have managed to mess it up, would have had to work really hard to screw that up. Because it was a beautiful, beautiful story, you know. So I don't take a lot of credit for it. I just kind of appreciate it, you know. I, I I'm still very proud of it to this day because uh, it, it was a very unusual job in that everybody was on their A game, you know. Yeah. I did the best work I could. Terry Austin did beautiful work. Christy Shield did beautiful work. Joe Rosen, the letterer, always did beautiful work. But the production in the office was on point. Everybody did their job. You know, everybody did their job and it just, it's gorgeous. It was a nice piece of work to this day. I look back on it and going, wow, I, we lucked out. I mean, that, that's just a really nice job. You know? Well, there's something that uh, I think you brought to the table that no other artist at the time was going to bring to the table, which, oh, which, oh. which was, uh, you know, it's a retelling of Spider-Man's origin. And at that point, at that point, um, I, I've I've just finished binging the first like 200 issues of Amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> so, okay. so at that point, I feel like every artist who followed John Romita Sr. Mm -hmm. was following John Romita Sr.'s model. I, but you weren't. You were you were well, doing the Ditko. I mean, I was very. I mean, I've, I'm obviously very influenced by Romita and Kirby and the Basemas and and all of that. What my philosophy is, and I'm going to have to disagree with you just a little bit there, Dewey. Um, Keith Pollard, who did issue 200 and was during the run up to 200, mm -hmm. he he would lift Ditko shots a lot. He he would he was using some Ditko too. So I mean, yeah, Spider Man had been very much in the in the public consciousness was very much the Ramita Spider Man at that point. But my my feeling for any any character, any character, is if you are lucky enough to work on a character that's been around for years and years and years, the best thing you can do is go back and read their very, very, very first appearances to get a sense of why that character is still around. You don't want to be the, just the next guy in a 50-year-long game of telephone where your work is only based on the last guy who did it instead of being based on everybody who did it, right? So to, to try to do that, I go back and I look at the very first appearances of characters. And, you know, what Ditko brought to Spider-Man was, I, I thought it was really important to that particular story because Spider-Man wasn't doing a lot. He wasn't fighting bad guys in that story. He was standing there talking to the kid. So I didn't want it to just be a, a generic superhero figure uh, in a costume. I wanted it to be Spider-Man, even as he was just standing there. And in my opinion, the best way to do that was to rip Ditko off like crazy and try to make it look as much like a Steve Ditko Spider-Man as possible. Because 
Steve Ditko's Spider-Man was just standing there. He was weird, you know, just standing yeah. there. He looked different. He looked unique. And you want, I wanted to get that uniqueness in uh, for, the, for the, the, uh, the, the sake of the story. And that's why I did it. I mean, going off what you're saying about Ramita being the standard, the, the couple of the things that did really uh, bother, by the time they ran that story, Danny Fingeroth was the editor. Yeah. And he was uncomfortable with a couple of the shots where I did like the reverse webbing on the mask and, you know, things that weren't the things that Ditko used to do just because he was Steve Ditko were hadn't been done in a long time because Ramita, Ramita had very much. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Standardized. Um, there you go. Standardized how the webbing went and everybody worked that way and, and all that kind of stuff. And some of it, I, I don't think in any deliberate sense, but some of it was the direct opposite of what Ditko used to do. You know, I mean, I, I've over the years, I've heard different illustrators say, you know, well, John Ramita Jr. told me that with the dad, his dad's secret was that no matter what direction uh, the webbing usually goes, if he's just standing there, if he, if you do foreshortening, you know, you, you make the webbing so it helps show the shape of the arm, you know, so it helps show the contour of the arm. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I figured that out when I was when I was a kid. I figured that out for myself. But the interesting thing is that's the way Ramita does it. And quite frankly, that's the way it looks in the movies, if you look at it. But Ditko did exactly the opposite. Ditko would always go for whatever made the webbing look rounder and, and more arched. And, and he never made the webbing look straight across. So if you do it one way, it looks very Ramita. If you do it the opposite way, it looks very Ditko. So it's actually kind of interesting in that way. Because I, like I said, I don't think it's deliberate at all on Ramita's part that he was trying to just do the opposite of Ditko, but it turns out that way. So it's actually kind of neat. Um, but yeah, there were, there were some things like that that I was trying to capture the Ditko. But at the same time, I was on Amazing. Uh, Rich Buckler was doing um, Peter Parker, the Spectacular yeah, Spider-Man. He was doing some Ditko lifts. You know, we were all playing around with the Ditko stuff and everything. So I can't take full credit for that kind of thing. But uh, if you want to give it to me, I'll take it. But, uh, you know, I, I, it wasn't all that unusual at the time. It, there was a little bit, because this was pre-Todd McFarlane. So there was a little bit of pushback from editorial about getting too ditko -y with Spider-Man. But, yeah. but once but once McFarlane showed up, they he blew the doors off it and everybody was going, oh, I guess you can draw Spider-Man however you want now. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, it, it drove, you know, it drove a lot of the old guard crazy. But they were, you know, a little... I, the story I heard is that the editor at the time, Jim Salakrup, was contemplating firing Todd McFarlane when all the fan mail started coming. And the fans loved him. They were just deluged with fan mail. So he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to fly in the face of what the fans obviously were loving. So you can't argue with the numbers. No, you don't, you don't argue with success. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Even editorial knows not to argue with success. So there you go. I think uh, I'll, I'll just say this right now. I think you're massively underrated, uh, even by me, because... <laughs> We were well, uh, shame on you, shame on <laughs> even by me because we were. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend, we do these videos on uh, like who the, who the best Spider Man artists are, and we had to do we had to do this best Spider Man artists one twice because I realized that there were certain things that you did that I thought John Romita Jr. did just because you were filling in on his run. Oh, okay, and um. And the main one for that was number two fifty one, the fight with a hobgoblin on top of okay. on top of the yeah. battle van, mm -hmm. and um, and it's like one of my favorite. I think it's one of the best action comics. No, no pun intended. No, <laughs> one of the best action packed comics ever made. And I think for the the younger me, just thought John Romita Jr. did it. And then when I finally was you know looking back at it, I was like, oh wait, Ron Friends did this. <laughs> yes, I did. That that was, and it was inked by Klaus Jansen. So I mean, he really he really helped it. It, it looks great. It, it's a neat looking book because of because of Klaus and the regular colorist and everything. I I mean, yes. And I didn't I didn't co-create Hobgoblin either. I mean, just 
just recently, there was a KSAR omnibus that they put together. And, and that was my first gig at Marvel was working on KSAR. And in the little creator credits in the back, it says that I worked with Roger Stern and co-created the Hobgoblin. No, I didn't. I didn't work with Roger Stern on Amazing Spider-Man and I didn't co-create the Hobgoblin. That was JR. So I don't know what people are thinking, but yeah, apparently I benefit from people <laughs> confusing me with other people. What's funny about that is there's a, there's a whole uh, segment of Marvel merchandising that's called, what is it called? Marvel Classic or something? Marvel, I think they, it's use called, the yeah. old, they use the old Marvel logo with the M and Marvel written across it. And they use the, the more classic artists. They use the Kirby and Ramita and Basema and, and some of my Thor shots are in have been used for that. Yeah, there, there, there's a shot by me in Breeding that was a cover shot. And there was a, there's a shot by me and Joe Sinnott that get used, gets used a lot in those things. And I'm, I'm almost sure they're in there because somebody thinks they're Kirby. You know, they, 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 I mean, yes, I do things where I, I hope that when I when I do a figure, I try to make sure that the cape is there, that everything's in it, you know. So, in, and I, I try to make it look like a complete figure. But I, I'm almost positive that a lot of people, that, that somebody in the in the choosing process, probably thought that, especially the one that's inked by Senate, probably thought that it was a Kirby shot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and pot, and, and the, the one that was inked by Brett Breeding actually is based on a Kirby shot. So they might have. They might have confused it with the original. I don't know. I don't know. You, you do it so well. But the thing with 251 isn't, it's not just the draftsmanship. It's also like the pacing, you know. The oh, that was a fun out. issue. Yeah, that fight in the van is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when he comes out, when Spider-Man comes out of the van and like really That was still, uh, that was a Roger plot. Uh, Roger Stern plotted 251 and 252. And Tom DeFalco just scripted over his plots. Uh, and so I was working off Roger's plot on those two issues. So that was, uh, then, you were working Marvel style, basically, would you say? Oh, yeah, very much so. I, I prefer it. And uh, yeah, on almost everything I did. The only thing that I didn't uh, do Marvel style on, traditional Marvel style, was Kesar, Because Bruce Jones, who was the writer at the time, pretty much just, mm -hmm. he wrote like little short stories. I mean, he didn't break down pages or anything. He it was It was an interesting first gig to get because it kind of forced me to, do my job even more than a regular plot would have because he wasn't doing any page counts at all he was just basically telling his little story like he was writing a short story with he said she said and all that kind of stuff you know um so i had to do all the pacing and uh so it, it did feel like getting thrown in on the deep end but it was good it, it was good experience for uh for doing the regular books so. And of course, that kicked off, you know, a longtime partnership between you and Tom DeFalco. Yes. How yes. Was... Uh, yeah. I mean, when you find the other side of your brain, it makes sense to hold on to it best you can, you know. So I have I have selfishly uh, sought out working with him whenever possible. Yes. Yeah. I mean, some people go like their whole career is looking for the perfect collaborator. And you found yours really early. Well, one of the first conversations we had, well, early on when he hired me for Marvel Team Up, he, he warned me that, uh, that he might be tough because he, you know, he's an editor that pays attention and everything. And I said, Tom, I, that, that doesn't frighten me at all because as wonderful as, I, as it was working for Louise Jones, we didn't have a lot of time for feedback. I would solicit feedback and she would say, Ron, you're doing fine. You know, as long as we're giving you the next plot, obviously we like what you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I was looking for more uh, feedback from the editor. I wanted to learn. And, uh, and Tom was a little, he has a little bit more of the teacher in him. So he did, you know, he, he did give you feedback and let you know what he liked and why he liked it. And he let you know what he didn't like and why he didn't like it. Um, but and we met in person at a convention, a small convention here in Pittsburgh, uh, along with Butch Geis. And we all, the three of us went out to dinner and we just had a casual conversation about what kind of comics we like and all that kind of stuff. And we found out in that conversation that DeFalco and I like the same kind of comics. You know, I mean, we were big fans of the mid to late 60s and the early 70s and 
you know, the Stanley stuff and the Marvel bombast, you know, the, yeah. the as Tom says, the hoo-ha action and all that kind of stuff. And we were very much on the same page when it came to what kind of stories we wanted to tell. And uh, so, yeah, it, 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 for me, it's always been a, an amazingly positive partnership. I, uh, I love it. I mean, he's done successful work with other people. I mean, Pat Olive and, and uh, uh, Ron Lim and, and Paul Ryan, you know, he's done runs with other guys that he, he don't need me, but I, I prefer to work with Tom whenever possible. Of course, I've worked with some great writers too. I've, you know, I've, I've gotten a chance to work with Roger Stern on Hobgoblin Lives and, uh, uh, Revenge of the Green Goblin miniseries is in Heroes Union. In Heroes Union, yes, yeah. the new project that's coming out on August fourth from uh, Binge Books. Buy it. Um, but you know, so Roger Stern has always been terrific. Joe Duffy was fantastic on Star Wars. I loved working with Joe. I think we made a really good team, uh, and uh, we enjoyed. I, I enjoyed doing the humor. Joe had that wonderful sense like in the Marvel movies and in the Star Wars movies of, yeah. of, of injecting some humor into the situations. And I always enjoyed that kind of stuff. And uh, really, really, I, everything I learned about collaboration and partnership, I really learned from Joe, which I think made me, you know, a better partner for DeFalco. But um, I owe her a lot. I mean, we, I, I enjoyed our partnership a lot. Um, you know, so I've been very fortunate with the writers I have worked with, but uh, you know, yeah, DeFalco has been the main one, and uh, I have no regrets about that. So, I think your first full issue with Tom DeFalco was 252 in 1984, where you introduced the alien costume, thus kicking off a trend, Mr. Friends. <laughs> well, he, script, he scripted 251 as well. Uh, our first issue together with that started my six-issue fill-in run was 255 with the, the Black Fox and the Red Ghost. And oh, yeah. Super- because yeah. uh, Roger was still still had the plot. Roger did not. By that point, Roger had not done any plots. Uh, DeFalco's first plot himself was 253 with Rick Leonardi. Oh, uh, yeah. Then introduced the Rose and, and all those, you know, that character and uh, sports sports betting and all that kind of stuff. It was a really cool story. And then he did Jack O'Lantern. And, and, and then stuff. you got back. To Tom, Tom's box. big thing on Spider-Man was that he wanted to create new characters. He didn't. You guys created much- Silver Sable. Exactly. As much as as much as I was an old time Spider Man fan and was just excited to be on Spider Man, he wanted to create new villains and not use the old ones because Roger had just gotten done doing some really really good stories with some of the classic villains. So he wanted to stay away from the classic villains for a while, which frustrated me. But I, you know, I enjoyed co creating the Puma and Silver Sable and Black Fox and. Uh, all of those characters with the Falcon. We got a lot of mileage out of Hobgoblin because we had to do something with him after he was introduced so big, you know, we had to continue with that mystery and stuff. So, and you guys got like a lot of mileage with the black cat too. Uh, well, yeah, she was, I, I think Al Milgram actually probably used her more than we yeah. did. Uh, Cause yeah, he was, the one was dealing, he was the one dealing primarily with that relationship with Peter Parker, but yeah. Yeah. Black cat was around. Uh, when we introduced, actually, when we introduced Silver Sable, my first sketches of her, she has uh, platinum blonde hair. She has yellow in her hair because we had Black Cat running around with the white hair. Uh, yeah. And I thought, well, we shouldn't have two characters running around with white hair. Uh, but editorial wisely decided, no, her name's Silver Sable. She's going to have silver hair, Ron, so stop it. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they went with the silver hair and and she was never in actually was in a panel with Black Cat anyway, so who cared? You know, that kind of ironically, there was that talk for a while there about them being in a movie together, uh, yeah. Black and Silver, which would have been interesting because that would have been a lot of white hair, you know. But of course, in the movie version, who the hell knows what color hair anybody's hair is going to be? So, it's the youngest white hair uh, duo ever. Well, yeah, well, yeah, because white, I don't know about black, black cats is supposed to be white, silvers is supposed to be silver. I mean, yeah, not not like old lady silver, her hair is supposed to be like liquid silver, you know, that kind of thing. I'm sure it's not natural, let's put it that shiny way. and silver. But yeah. I was gonna say, which, uh, you know, 251 kicks off a trend, Mr. Friends, where you work with classic characters not in their costume. Oh, please, costume. none of them were that was not my idea. Like, <laughs> None of that was my fault. 
Superman was not my idea. Spider Man was not my idea. Even Thor was not my Thunder idea. Strike, yeah. I mean, even yeah, when even when you got on of, Thor, no, he was in the no, Walt Simonson armor. It always, it was always somebody else's idea, and I was just sitting in the car with the engine running. I was the guy. I was the getaway driver. I was no, it was not my fault. When they sent me, <laughs> when they hired me to do those six issues, and they sent me some Xeroxes with my with my with the plot of two fifty two. Mm -hmm. And it was Mike Zek's original drawings of the black costume. I thought it was a new villain. I thought it was a new villain. And then I was told, no, no, that's Spider-Man's new costume. I mean, as a longtime fan, I was like, really? After, you know, I'm 25, I get finally get to draw the amazing Spider-Man <laughs> and, re, you know, live my childhood dream. And yet he's not dressed in his regular costume. He's in a new suit. And so I was a little frustrated myself, but... Uh, yeah, and, and then the, the Thor thing, that was all DeFalco's idea. He said, how would you feel if, well, you know, because Walt did the armor, so we just went back to the, the old look. The classic. But then Tom, Tom was the one who said, how would you feel if Eric took charge? If we did a, if we did a run of books where Thor is, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, gone. Yes, gone. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's in uh, a bag. Uh, well, he wasn't in the bag. He wasn't he was in the bag. In train. But he was, uh, what, what did Heindel do to him? He, uh, I forget what the word is. I'm just really, I'm being 61 tonight, boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he was, uh, Thor was gone and Eric's personality took over and we'll give him a new costume and we'll, you know, we'll jazz him up a little bit. And I said, oh, really? We'll give him a new costume. Any ideas? And he goes, no, that's your problem. And I went, oh, okay. So I said, listen, I, let me work on it. So we continued on with the storyline. Um, and I was at one point sitting at a table with Brett Breeding and we started doing some sketches and we came up with some ideas and I wanted to bring the helmet back because I really liked the helmet from, from Walt's armor and all this kind of stuff. So uh, I brought that back and uh, played with some other more modern, I, I, I came up with what we came up with. And I called, and then when I called the Falco, I said, okay, I have a design I'm happy with. So we can go ahead and pull the trigger on this whole Eric taking charge thing. So that's what we did. And uh, we got another couple of years of cool stories out of that, but that was not my idea. And Superman was absolutely <laughs> not my idea. They were already doing that storyline with his, where his powers were changing and everything. And they, they contacted everybody that was drawing a Superman book at the time. Because there were, you know, counting anchors, there were about three or four Superman titles. So that's yeah. eight guys total. And they said, if you have, if you want to submit an idea, here's the deal. His powers are electrical and his costume should serve as a containment suit. That's what you need to know. If you want to submit an idea, please do. So I wasn't really going to submit one. I was fairly new on the books. I really didn't think I should. You know, I didn't really have any ideas that were driving me crazy or anything. But one night after after I was finished with my pages for the day, I went, you know, I do have this one idea with, you know, making the yes look like a lightning bolt and all this kind of stuff. So I, I sketched my idea. I figured, what the hell? I sent it in with my next batch of pages. And I didn't hear anything. Nobody heard anything. They were uh, in, in DC's little, uh, the, the editorial pages in the back of the books. I forget what they were calling it, direct currents or whatever they were calling it. They were showing some of the designs. They were showing like Bogdanov's design and, and Dan Jurgen's design and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I, at one point I got a package from the office and it had my sketch of, of Superman and it just had the logo on it. They said, this is what we want this for the next cover. And I said, are we doing, are, so are we gonna do a month of covers where we show everybody's design or something? And they went, no, we picked your design. And I went, oh, nobody told me, you know. Uh, so that's how I found out that they had picked my design. They, I think they picked my design because he was all one color. He was all blue. And for years, Glenn Whitmore, the colorist at the Superman summits, had been saying he wanted to do Superman Red, Superman. He wanted to do a retelling of the, of the, the, night, the early 60s story, Superman Red, Superman Blue. So I honestly think that the two reasons they picked my design is one, I was the only one that really messed around with the S and made it look different. And two, they wanted to do Superman red, Superman blue, and my guy was all blue so they could do a Superman that was all red. 
Those are the two reasons they picked my design. It had nothing to do with them going, this is the best design we've ever seen. It was just that I met the criteria, you know. So that, again, was not my idea. I do not come on a character and go, well, the first thing we need to do <laughs> is redesign this man so I am satisfied. Never happened. Never happened. Spider-Man's got the best costume in the world. Ditko is a genius. That is the best damn costume I've ever seen in my life. And anybody who redesigns Superman, and I include everybody in that, I include everybody from the movies and Jim Lee and anybody else that wants to mess around with redesigning Superman, is an idiot because Superman's a perfect design. It works great. Just do that. You'll be fine. But no, people have to be crazy about it. So I, I do not cop to any of those, any of them. Look, people, the red trunks work, okay? That, absolutely, they work. They work. Just you leave know, them there alone. Is no, there's no denying. You see Christopher Reeve standing there in that costume. It's like, Holy shit! That's Superman. Uh, and Superman and Lois. They did. They they did this uh, Fleischer version yeah. for the guy. Have you seen this? Yes. It's gorgeous. It looks fantastic on screen. It looks great. What's Why your, anybody would mess with it? I have no idea. What's your favorite S shield? Uh, probably the standard one. I I got really yeah. good at drawing it. You know, so the the original. But I mean, I there are a few that I like. I you know. <laughs> At one point, Tom and I did a uh, Defalco and I did a, a one shot uh, called Superman Beyond yeah. that had Bruce Timm's design. Tom didn't even know that was an S because <laughs> by, by the time Tim, Tim did that, when he was working off of like Alex Ross's design, so uh, it really looked it really just had like a slash across it. You had to read like the outline of the S, and then it was a slash, and you had to read the point as part of the S. Defalco didn't even realize it was an S. He goes. Do you know why he has a seven on his chest? I said, it's not a seven, you idiot. It's the S. <laughs> it's, it's just really, really graphic. You know, that kind of thing. Did, uh, who is harder to mimic, Steve Ditko or Jack Kirby? Probably, I would, uh, probably Ditko. Uh, the Ditko-isms are subtler than the Kirby-isms. I mean, a lot of the people that do Kirby overdo it as far as i'm concerned because you know they they do like the, the giant fingers and they do the squirrels for no reason you know the little squirrels for no reason and all that kind of stuff and and that wasn't jack jack had a reason for what he was doing he you know his his slashes and lines and legs and stuff were muscles they were stylized but he was showing muscle groups he was showing and he was using them in a way that actually helped the movement of the character. I mean, the guy knew what he was doing and he was very, very good at it. So anybody who just, I'm doing Kirby by drawing a hand like this and putting squiggles on it is not doing Kirby. I mean, Jack knew what he was doing. He knew what he knew how to draw and he knew what he was doing. Can I ask uh, you? The things, the things that make Ditko Ditko, you know, like the hands and and some of the attitudes and some of the facial expressions are, are a lot subtler than what uh, than what Kirby is known for. It's a little more neurotic. <laughs> Given their personalities, yes, probably. I mean, I, I noticed there's a thing on Facebook now that's even asking if, if Ditko might have been on the spectrum. And mm. uh, a lot of creative people are probably on the spectrum. I, you know, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm on the spectrum to one degree or another, you know. But uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if guys like Kirby and Ditko were on the spectrum. Can I ask you something about, about Kirby? Because um, I think a lot of people my age, just a, maybe even a little bit older than me, um, a lot of us, even me before, I, I did not get, do not get Jack Kirby. Um, right. I, I do now. But okay. what was it like seeing, uh, you know, Jack Kirby's work? I, Jack it's is... It's about, it's emotion. It, you know, Jack is not logic, <laughs> okay? Um, there is nothing about Jack that makes you want to like, well, he's not drawing me. He's not drawing this muscle group correctly at all. No, Jack is about telling the story and he's about making you feel the, what the characters are going through. He, he's there, even, even his work from the 40s, it was all exaggerated movement and really bold action and dynamics and stuff. But 
he wants you to get dragged from one panel to the other. It's it's an it's a it's an experience. It's a it's yeah. I I, I, I mean my all my reactions to Jack Kirby are emotional, not not logical. You know, uh, the stuff that really grabbed me, to tell you the truth, when I was growing up, it was in the early seventies when he went to DC, and Mike Royer started lettering and inking his stuff. It just grabbed me by the throat like the early Marvels did and said, look at this. This is really interesting. This something dynamic is happening here, you know. So it was never it's never about, well, that's what not, that's not what a knee looks like. No, it, he's not trying to tell you that's what a knee looks like. He's trying to tell you, Joy, that that's what a knee feels like. <laughs> Because he can, he can draw. He can draw this character like he drew a, an issue of Thor where Thor fought him. You know the character yeah. that became Adam Warlock, and there's just shots in there because Adam Warlock doesn't have a costume; he was just wearing trunks. And there's shots of his back, and there's shots of Captain America fighting these creatures, the, these characters that don't have a lot of costume to them, where like the, the back muscles, the way he draws the shoulder blade, and they look like geographic plates slamming together you know i mean he just he puts so much power into everything he does with these with these really bold strokes and it it really is about as ridiculous as it sounds it's about it's about how it makes you feel yeah. it's not about being accurate you know it's not about drawing human he knows human anatomy i mean if you look at his 1940 stuff it was much more anatomically correct but he was slowly experimenting with stretching that and stretching that to the outer boundaries of reality. And, and a Kirby story takes place in this zone where everything is dramatic and every movement is, is over-exaggerated and all the action is over-exaggerated and it's powerful. But you know, if you, if you look at Kirby and, and all you're seeing is, well, that's not, that's not what fingers look like then you're dead inside you know <laughs> it's like people that watch it's a wonderful life and don't tear up at the end and just kind of go well that was very saccharine well then you know they're dead you know they're dead inside <laughs> and, and you don't have to talk to them anymore you know so you finally grew up i mean i i will admit that, that there are times i i've even had the experience where you kind of grow into appreciating kirby yeah. more and more and more for what he does i mean as i learned more about comic storytelling and what was necessary to make a comic exciting i i started to realize oh my god all that stuff that i that i learned and kind of unlearned from kirby as i started to get more concerned with what muscles really look like and you know and all this kind of stuff because when i was in when i was in uh, high school i was doing this really broad Kirby thing you know a, yeah. a buddy of mine and I had created our own characters and we were doing you know I had like over 100 issues plotted of these characters and all this kind of stuff and I was doing these drawings I I never did an actual story I never did sequential storytelling but I I would do scenes from the story on eight and a half by 11 paper and stuff and I was doing this really broad version of Kirby you know um and it really in, informs your dynamics, but you know when when you get caught up in in then doing life drawing and and worrying about how muscles really connect and all this kind of stuff, you start to lose a little bit of that, and you really you really have to find that balance. And and quite frankly, the people that have found that balance are the Ramitas and the, and John and Sal Pasema. They they found that balance between accurate anatomy and Kirby dynamics, you know, Don Heck was another one who was able to find that balance, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, these are the guys who, you know, kept what Kirby had to teach them and, but brought real anatomy to it. I mean, Neil Adams, early Neil yeah, Adams I was gonna say. is another example of somebody who's a terrific illustrator, but he also knew, he also learned something from Kirby, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all of them are, you know, and I, again i mean my style whatever that is is admittedly an amalgam of everybody i grew up looking at you know i mean 
Uh, I, I'm a, a very much a student of John and Salma Sema and John Ramita and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and Will Eisner. I mean, anything I can learn from any of these guys, I will try to incorporate into my work. Uh, uh, working with Brett Breeding on some Superman projects that weren't for print, they were for iPads and stuff. I really was studying uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez on uh, his Superman work. And yeah, it, it's amazing, you know, and, and the way he handles anatomy is very accurate, but still very exaggerated. And so I, I'm always looking to learn something from somebody new, you know, and uh, incorporate it into my stuff. But uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I was incorporating animation for the longest time on Spider-Girl when I first got on, uh, on Spider-Girl after Pat Olive. Yeah. I was, my, my characters were very elongated and, and very animated. And I was having a lot, a lot of fun, you know, finding the positions and, and kind of, he was doing a thinner version of Spider-Girl at that time. And, and I took it in a cartoony direction where she was like so skinny the readers were writing in and going, boy, somebody give this girl a sandwich, you know, and things like that. And they were right. I mean, it got, it got too far. So I started to pull myself out of it into issue 100. And then when we relaunched with amazing spider girl, number one, mm -hmm. I decided to, you know, leave some of that behind and try to re connect with my Basema and my Ramita and all that kind of stuff and, and kind of move forward from there. So, you know, if you're if you're doing monthly comics you're always learning new things and evolving and trying new things and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't you know in the course of seven years on thor i drew his helmet wings like five different ways you know i drew him like kirby for a while then i drew him like basema for a while then i drew him like sal basema for a while i mean you just it helps keep you interested and you're experimenting with you know you're experimenting and finding out what works for you you know when you returned to marvel in 97 uh you know it was on hobgoblin lives with roger stern mm -hmm. uh how did it feel wrapping up that story that you know that's technically the hanging story when you first started on amazing to begin with yeah but, i it uh, i liked i mean i didn't think it was necessary okay um like Tom DeFalco, as big a Roger Stern fan as he is, you know, Roger had been pitching this story ever since they did the reveal that it was Ned Leeds, but he was killed by the foreigners guys and all this kind of stuff, right? As soon as that was published, uh, as soon as Superman, or Superman, as soon as Spider-Man Wolverine was published, Roger had been pitching this to various editors, okay? That there was more to the story that, you know, I, you could still do this. And for years, he'd been pitching it and editors weren't biting. Glenn Greenberg finally was the one who went, you know, well, that could be really fascinating. And, and Roger's a great writer, so let's give it a shot. So he and I think his, edit, uh, his editor with Tom Brevoort, I think they, they decided together to hear what Roger wanted to do. And Roger came up with this three issue structure that reintroduced all of the suspects from his run and it read like a movie, you know, uh, when they sent me the plot, because I was kind of leaning a little bit to Falco's camp, you know, that, or is, it, is this really necessary? Can he make this work? But Roger's a, a he's a technical writer. He's a, a solid by the book writer, yeah. you know, he knows how to write a good story. So when I read the plots, I called the Falco and I said, the son of a bitch did it, man, <laughs> it works. You reintroduce all the characters, you know who the suspects are. He he slowly, you know, reveals the the idea of the of, of the brother, and it it worked. I I was really happy to be a part of it. Um, unfortunately, I I think that I think the three issues suffer a little bit from not having this consistent anchor because uh, George Perez signed on to ink this thing, yeah. and uh, he inked all three covers, but. Unfortunately, I don't know what he got called away to do. I mean, that guy was always getting offered big deals. I mean, he left, like the, he left like the Infinity, uh, one of the Infinity runs yeah, Infinity to Gauntlet. go do something at DC. And so I don't know what got, what called him away this time, but, you know, he only did the first issue. 
And we had uh, a couple of people pinch hitting on the second issue, and then Bob McLeod came in on the third issue. And I, you know, I thought the first issue and the third issue looked great. The second issue suffers for, for you know, some inconsistent uh, inking, but uh, you know, overall, I think it reads well. I think it's a terrific story, and I'm glad Roger got to make the Hobgoblin who he originally wanted it to be. You know. Yeah. It was, as a creator, uh, we, we, I, as a creator, that's great if you can do that. You know, if you can get that, if you get around to that. I I think uh, he got called away. Uh, George got called away to do Avengers for Heroes Return. At that point, I'm not sure though. Um, I, I'm not either. I I don't know exactly what it was. I just know that uh, it you know it was a shame because some consider. I mean, either that or if Bob if Bob McCloud could have done the whole thing. Or if George could have done the whole, if one guy could have inked the entire thing, it would have been, I think it would have looked a little better. But uh, I mean, the people that inked the second issue were not slouches. And Scott Hanna mm -hmm. and uh, Jerome K. Moore, I, those were the two primary ones. I don't know if there was anybody else or not. Pat Olive even helped me with some pencils on the second issue because I was, uh, you know, deadlines were getting a little heavy and everything. So he uh, he tightened up some pencils for me on that, on the second issue. So. Yeah, it was it was a crazy job, but overall, I I liked it. I, it. It's something that I can look back on it and be glad I was a part of it. You know, it's another another little bit of Spider-Man history that I get to be a part of. You know, you're you're part of a lot of that. Speaking of which, Mayday Parker, is yes. that the longest character you've ever worked on? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, we were on Thor for like seven years, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which. I don't. I don't know which account. Well, Mayday, I came on. I did the first issue. Then yeah. Pat came on, and Pat was on through the late fifties or something like that. He was. I forget when my first issue was. I think I came on. I came on during season of the serpent, and I don't know if that was in the fifties or sixties. But um, and then I did it up through one hundred. Then we did thirty issues of. Yeah of amazing, amazing spider girl and then we did some various and sundry stuff in the uh, anthologies and everything but um you know the character the character was around all told when she was around like 13 years 13 14 years something like that and uh you know and i did my my share you know <laughs> and i i think pat probably still he, he i don't know if he we probably did an equal amount i would think i don't know because from 60, 60 something to 100, only be 40, another 30, it'd be 70. I may have done a little bit more Spider Man yeah. than he's done. But uh, you know. now you did more Spider Girl than he did. Okay. Because you did. Oh, uh, you yeah, you jumped oh, on at 52 and then you kept going. And then you had that those extra 30 issues. Well, I did a couple of fill ins while Pat was the regular artist. And then uh, those, yeah, those as well uh but yeah I, I i don't know for sure but yeah i mean spider girl was a great run I, it was a neat it was a neat place to be because i helped create the mc2 future mm -hmm. and uh i love those characters so and you were kind of in your own little corner where you you know you weren't being forced into all of the stuff that was going on in the main marvel universe all the time you know where they were always trying to do uh those those big events i mean our editor was the one at the time our editor was the one who wanted us to do uh when they were doing one more day yeah one more oh, day. brand brand new day when yeah. they were doing brand new day they she said i want you to do brand new may you decide what it's going to be and defalco and i had some long conversations about it he had some completely different ideas of what brand new may could be but we ended up doing the thing with uh, you know just embracing the uh, the clone stuff and everything and having some fun with that uh but that you know that a lot of that stuff comes from the editors you know that they they wanted i mean we had editors on spider girl that were we had a couple of editors that one didn't know why the book was being published didn't like the book i was gonna say yeah and, and every and every time they would say uh, sales are starting. They're worried that sales are going to dip. Uh, maybe it's time we kill Pete. Maybe it's time we kill Mary Jane. You know, and it's like, really? No, the book is about family. The book is about legacy. You can't kill the parents and have a teenager just living on her own. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, so we always resisted that kind of stuff, you know, with the first annual cover, that was kind of my idea 
a little bit. I mean, Pat did a fantastic job. It was inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. But Tom and I talked about that, that, that idea of uh, it introduced a character, Misery, yeah. who was making her worst nightmares come true. And so we, we talked about that. And Pat, like I said, Pat did a great job of it. It's a cover with May Day standing there screaming as uh, both Pete and Mary Jane are lying dead. And it's like, well, if nothing else, this will satisfy the editors because they, they've wanted this for years, you know, that kind of thing. But it didn't really happen. So I there were other there were people we did a cover one time. It was a, an issue that I was very proud of called The Girl Who Fell to Earth, because May Day had just come back from a big cosmic experience. And it was a, a small story about uh, relationship abuse about boyfriends abusing their girlfriends. And there was, an, uh, the, the cover was Spider Girl holding a, an unconscious girl in her arms. And for some reason, everybody thought it was Mary Jane. It wasn't dressed like Mary Jane. Oh. It, it didn't look like Mary Jane. It, you couldn't see her face, but it, I, never, I never wanted anybody to think it was Mary Jane. I mean, she was dressed like a teenager. So it didn't make any sense that people would think it was Mary Jane, but we had letters from people that went, that was a really you know, mean thing you did, making us think Mary Jane was going to die. And it's like, we weren't trying to make you think Mary Jane was going to die. You're nuts, man. I so. apologize for the behavior of some fans. <laughs> well, I'm a fan too. So uh, I, on behalf of us, I apologize. <laughs> No need to apologize. I have found out in my 30 some years in this industry that there are a, there's a certain breed of fan and you hear from them all the time that have no sense of humor about their comics. No, uh, when we were when we were on Thor and image was very, very big at the time. And we did that one Thor cover with Eric where he's holding the big gun and yeah. he's firing the big gun and it said no more Mr. Nice God. We, we just did it as we were having fun. That was a we joke. Just thought yeah. it was, yeah, because I even did a little bit more of an imagey style on that cover and everything. And and the fans, they always assume the worst. They always assume like we're we're selling out, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I, we did one cover. We did a Thunderstrike cover that it was while it was when Venom was really big for a while there. They were doing the mini series and, the, and they just launched the first Venom series and Venom was huge. Like Wolverine was huge, you know. And we, on a cover of a Thunderstrike, we guest starred Spider-Man. And on the cover, it said, from the pages of Venom, the amazing <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> and the fans just went, how dare you disrespect Spider-Man like that? It was a joke. Lighten up, for God's sake. You obviously got the joke. You're just pissed about it instead of laughing, you know. There's that one issue of Thunderstrike where you know the cover is Loki. It's the it's an homage to number one Avengers number one. Uh, it's it's Loki, but instead of the Avengers, it's Thunderstrike. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, War, War Machine, Machine and, and Scott, Scott Lang. Lang. Yeah. And yeah. I think some I people were Warriors. like, were like, why did they do this and not have them be a team? So I don't know. Shut up. Because the the entire thing is a setup for nah <laughs> you know, I mean, it, the whole thing was a it was a setup for that punchline but i mean we did have you know we had scott hanging out with uh Rhodey and yeah. i mean i i like the dynamic if, if thunderstrike would have continued it, it, not to say we might not have seen them team up again but uh you know we tom and i were referring to them as not the avengers you know that yeah. kind of thing so. were you sad when uh when the decision was made to kill off thunderstrike uh, I was very, very upset by it because Thunderstrike wasn't canceled because of numbers. Thunderstrike was canceled. Uh, Thunderstrike was selling fine. Uh, their ne Thunderstrike never should have been canceled. The reason Thunderstrike was canceled was uh, Ron Perlman's people. Uh, Ron Perlman was the uh, cosmetics guy that bought Marvel and owned Marvel for a while. They had a big meeting of their people and Tom DeFalco was at this meeting. And, and one of Ron Perlman's people said that if we cancel half the line, the half that's left will sell twice as well. Oh, what a dumb idea. Yes. I mean, it, it's not how publishing works. Right? No, it's not. DeFalco, DeFalco laughed out loud. He thought, it, he thought they were kidding. 
And then when he realized they weren't kidding, he realized, oh, I'm going to get fired. And he did. Um, but yeah, that's Thunderstrike, War Machine, Force Works. All those books were selling fine. And the, but the, when they decided that they were going to cancel half the line, the editors had to decide what books to cancel. And they weren't going to cancel four. So they canceled Thunderstrike, right? Now, what really pissed me off is just a short time later, uh, within, within a year or so, they did that stupid Heroes Reborn thing mm -hmm. with the image guys, and they canceled Thor. They did. And it's like, what the hell, man? If you were going to, if you, if it was that easy to cancel Thor, you could have kept Thunderstrike, and we could still be doing Thunderstrike to this day, for God's sakes. You know, it, it was just, that was very frustrating. Could you imagine um, doing a Thunderstrike book with Thor out of the picture? Sure. Right? Like, uh, yeah. with, with Thor in the Heroes Reborn world? Like, that's a whole new story opportunity right there. Well, we actually we actually did a three issue uh, Hercules series. Yeah, there was a pilot to maybe bring Hercules in and do a series with him, and it was all about Shield trying to make the most of the superheroes that were left, you know, because of the the heroes disappearing. So yeah, that would have been very cool. But so as far as him getting killed, I was a part of that decision. So. No, I don't regret that decision. But I, what, what we didn't want to have happen is we didn't want Eric Masterson to become like Rick Jones, or mm -hmm. that is if, um, if if that if if Eric was hanging around with the Avengers, that uh, some idiot would come along. Point there that should help. Uh, would that some writer would come along at some point and want to turn Eric into another superhero, you know, like Banana Man, as Tom would say, you know. <laughs> but we don't want somebody coming along and turning Eric into Banana Man. And I said, no, no, we don't want that. So quite frankly, our idea from the very beginning was that Eric was not going to survive. Uh, if we had, if not, for the, if not for the sales department coming to us and saying, we want Eric to get his own book, Eric would have died in Thor. Oh. Uh, the original plan was that Loki was going to come back and Thor was going to leave uh, Eric on Earth as Thor and his version of Thor because he gave him Mjolnir. And then Thor was going to stay on Asgard and become king. He was finally going to take the throne. He was going to marry Sif, all that kind of stuff. And if we had stayed on the book, what would have happened is they would have gotten married they would have been on Asgard. Eric would have been Thor on Earth, but Loki would have come back. And in a big battle, like nobody has ever seen before, he would have killed Eric. And Thor would have realized, I just put a, I put a target on Eric and now he's dead. It's my fault. I never should have made Earth somebody else's problem. Sif, take the throne. I got to go protect Earth. And he would have had a big knockdown drag out with Loki and all this kind of stuff. Uh, quite probably would have killed Loki a second time. <laughs> and and uh, that was, you know, our game plan from the very beginning that Eric was not going to survive this yeah. experience. So it happened sooner than we wanted it to happen. But, you know, we still played it the way we were going to play it. You know, he still sacrificed himself. So. Early on in your Thor run, you you drew a moment that completely changed the dynamic of Thor and Captain America. Okay. And I think you know the moment I'm talking about because I'm almost sure I do. Because in 2019, in Avengers Endgame, Captain America lifts uh, Mjolnir. Right. Did I don't think, but I don't think it had anything to do with us. I he had uh, by the by the ooh, by the time they did Endgame. He had lifted the hammer like two or three other times in different storylines. So I don't think that had anything to do with us. But I do want to point out, as I as I am well, it started with you. Well, it started. We were the first ones to do yeah. it. And we were the first ones to do it because Brett Breeding, our anchor, said to me in a conversation, he and I are good friends to this day. He said to me in a conversation, you know, it actually does say on the hammer, because they had already done beta ray bill. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, 
you know, Brett was saying, you know, what Walt did was really interesting because after all those years, it always did say, whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, you know, he goes, you know, if anybody would be worthy of lifting the hammer, you'd think it would be Steve Rogers. And I went, hmm. And I was next time I was talking to Tom DeFalco, I went, you know, Tom, Brett brought up an interesting point. If anybody who's worthy enough to lift the hammer, it would be Steve Rogers. And Tom went, hmm. And we wanted to do this story where Thor became aware of the armor wars, you know, where Thor became aware of the conflict between the captain and Iron Man, because it was, you know, it's the big three. And Thor had been away. He had been in, uh, in doing in cosmic adventures. Yeah, he was off world. So we wanted to do a story that, that got him back into continuity and got him back into what was going on with the Avengers. So it, um, it, it was a moment that kind of wrote itself where it's like, okay, how does Thor pick a side in this? Because Iron Man's one of his, you know, Tony Stark's one of his oldest friends. In fact, at that point, Tony and Don Blake were the only two Avengers that knew each other's secret identities. I was going to say before that story, that's why I said right. change it forever before that story. They were, they were close, close. They were close as, as, as any Avengers could be. They knew each other's identities and stuff. Um, so, you know, but we'll be obviously, you know, we were thinking, you know, well, Cap's the one that's right in this whole thing. So <laughs> that's, we want him to side with Cap. Why would he side with Cap? And it, Brett's idea plugged right in, you know, that, it, you know, in the same way that in the movie they used it, they used uh, when Vision was able to pick up the hammer. Yeah. That made Thor trust the Vision, you know. Uh, so that that's what we were originally thinking, too. Is that what would be the slam dunk thing that could happen that would make Thor go, okay, Cap, I'm on, I'm on your side. And that was it. And having him wield the hammer was it. Now, did he really wield the hammer? The one, the one thing Tom DeFalco was always really good at was hedging his bets on whether or not Cap really picked up the hammer or whether Thor was calling it to him and Cap just happened to, to be, you know, have his hands on it at the time. Because he, he, what he did was, he did, he did spin it. He, uh, yeah. he knocked a whole bunch of soldiers off of him and then he kind of spun it like, a, like an Olympic um, shot put or something like that uh, and threw it to Thor. Um, but even when we had Eric lift it, we were, we strongly suggested that Thor was calling the hammer at the same time, you know, that kind of thing. We never really meant for anybody to think that Eric was worthy because the only way he was wielding the hammer as Thor was Thor was inside him. Thor was in his, you know, he didn't realize it, but Thor was deep, very deep in his psyche. So that's what made him worthy to, to wield the owner. Did your uh, that, that and the fact that he took it very seriously. Did your convention list, commission list, you know, convention fan lines change after Endgame came out? Um, Brett and I are talking about doing a, a print that, that we can both sell at conventions of, you know, recreating, possibly recreating that splash page, but with him in his Captain America costume instead of dressed as the captain, you know. Okay. And, and yes, I've done my share of commissions since of, of Cap wielding the hammer. Everybody wants Cap wielding the hammer. Um, so it's yeah. such a moment. How did you feel when you saw that in the theater? I, I, well, I knew it was going to, I didn't know it was going to happen, but I had plenty of people calling me going, have you seen Endgame yet? And I'm going, no, because there's something in there that you're not going to believe. And by the time, enough people <laughs> said that to me, by the time enough people said that to me, I kind of figured out what it was because they had suggested it in age of Ultron, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> But, but my question to those people was, did, did it, was it staged the way we staged it? And they went, no. And I went, well, then, so what? I mean, you know, great minds think alike. What can I tell you? You know, uh, like I said, he, he wielded it a couple more times in the comic books before, uh, before he did it in the movies. So who knows which, which comic book they were inspired by, you know, or they came up with the idea on their own, you know. It was hilarious to me because there's like a, a few groups I was in and they were like, um, I think this there's this one scene from from uh, Avengers Endgame that was inspired by JLA Avengers number four, you know, and then so somebody will reply with, 
oh no, it was inspired by Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. Yeah. Like yeah. You know, once somebody reads those two comments, they know exactly what you mean. Well, in Avengers, in the first Avengers movie, the, the idea of the uh, the the hover, uh, what 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 do they call those things? Uh, the shield, um, the bases. What are they called? Uh, the helicarrier. Helicarriers. Thank yeah. you. Good lord. <laughs> um, the idea of the helicarriers being in the water and taking off from the water in our three issue Hercules miniseries, we were the first ones to do that. That's where it's from, yeah. But well, but did Joss Whedon see that? Because I understand, I never saw it, but I understand they did it in the Ultimates too. And the fact that they that they did it in the Ultimates, that's probably if Joss Whedon saw it somewhere, he probably saw it in the Ultimates and not in our and hardly anybody saw our Hercules miniseries. But I always loved the Helicarrier, the original design of the Helicarrier by Kirby. I always loved it. But I always looked at it and go, how does this thing land? Where, where does this thing land? And then I went, wait a minute, it's an aircraft carrier. It lands in the water, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. So uh, when we were going to do S.H.I.E.L.D. in the Hercules thing, I, I pitched the idea to Tom, let's see it. Let's have, the, let's have them show up on helicopters and go, wow, that is a big aircraft carrier. And then actually show the, the propellers coming up and deploying and, uh, and have it lift up out of the water. And Tom loved the idea, so we did it. But uh, it, so when I saw it in the Avengers, it always made sense to me, you know, but then I found out I, I didn't find out until after the fact that they had already they had done it in uh, the Ultimates, too. So, you know, at first I thought, oh, cool. They maybe they somebody saw the Hercules miniseries, but then I went, no, nah, they did it in the Ultimates. So that's probably where they saw it. I mean, a lot of people think in Endgame that DeFalco and I get a credit at the end of Endgame. They think it's because of Cap lifting the hammer. It's not. Really? The reason we get a credit at the end of Endgame uh, in the special thanks thing is because we get one at the end of Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp because when they decided they were going to do the two generations with Hank Pym and Scott Lang oh. uh, and Hank Pym's daughter is named Hope, that's from an issue of A Next. We, yeah. had, we had Hank and Janet have twins. It was Hank Jr. and Hope. Yeah. And they used uh, that name. So Tom and I get a thanks, special thanks credit at the end of Ant-Man and at the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And at the end of Endgame, pretty much everybody who got a credit in all the other movies, they get a thank you credit in Endgame because everybody shows up in Endgame, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that our, our special thanks in Endgame is because Hope Lang shows up, or Hope Lang, Hope, uh, Hope, uh, yeah. Hope Pym, Hope yeah. Pym shows up as um as the wasp. wasp yeah yeah that's that's our only real claim to fame on um on the shield tv series we got credit for a couple of weeks uh we got a special thanks credit <laughs> because they used they were using every shield agent from the comic books they could come up with they weren't using them the same way but they were using every shield agent they could come up with and again in that hercules miniseries we had an agent I think she was 33, I'm not sure. But she was a, a, a historian and she knew all about Hercules from the legends and all this kind of yeah. stuff. She was a mythology expert. And her name was Kara Lynn Palamas, which was based on a Star Trek character from the episode that had Apollo in it. And when we were looking for a shield number for her, I looked at an old uh, Star Trek uh book that said that that was episode 33 or something like that okay so we, so we use 33 so and so on shield one time they had a, a character named Kara who was agent 33 was a completely different character but they used those two things 33 and Kara and so they gave Tom DeFalco and I a credit at the end of those episodes which was just silly you know I mean how can you take credit for a number but, <laughs> The name. Well, the character was so different, though. It was yeah. so it was silly. But you know, it's nice that they're doing that. It's nice that they're that they're giving some credit. And and if stuff if stuff you create shows up in a movie, you get a you get a little check. You get a nice check. So I, I can't complain. You know, I mean, I, I wish more. I wish they were using more of our stuff. You know, I I actually saw some stuff in Thor: The Dark World that reminded me very much of stuff that Defalco and I did. But what about 
Go ahead. What about Silver Sable in the uh, Spider-Man video game? You guys, we we get we get money for that. Yes, that's, that's pretty cool. It is. I mean, Silver Sable. We've made we've made a lot of decent money on Silver Sable. She's been done several times as action figures. She's been in the, the cartoons. The, uh, she was in video games before that. She's been in uh all three animated versions she was in the yeah. computer animated uh, mtv version she was in the original fox version and she was in the uh, spectacular version yeah uh different versions of the character but yeah they use they've been using her quite a bit the only thing i regretted about um the spectacular spider-man because i really loved that series uh that instead of using puma they kind of made craven into puma mm-hmm they made, they turned Craven into a lion guy, a lion man, instead of using Puma. But uh, but it was it was interesting because they were still kind of basing him on Puma. But uh, I'd still like to see you know Puma show up. I mean they've done action figures and busts of him and all that kind of stuff. But uh, but he was a he was a fun character. I'd love to see him in animation. Why do you think Mayday Parker resonated so much? I mean, I, uh, one thing that stood out to me was the whole Spider Girl bit is a spinoff of, at the time, the most maligned Spider Man storyline in history. Right. The Clone Saga. And you guys yeah. created something out of it that uh, resonated with so many people for so long. Yeah. I. I think the, the character and the idea of the book, I, I don't think the book would have been a success without Pete and Mary Jane. Okay, and I think the sweet spot that Spider Girl hit was young fans liked it because of the legacy aspect. You know, young fans liked it because they could be May Day, and it's like waking up one morning and finding out your dad was Spider Man. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. But older fans liked it because Peter Parker was finally aging with them. Pete was finally, you know, late thirties, early forties, and all this, and and. Uh, everybody feels like Peter Parker should age with them. You know, they, they don't want Pete to stay eternally 20 something. They want Pete to be their Pete, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think it kind of hit a sweet spot that way with older and younger readers. But I, I, I swear to God, the, the, the spider girl fans are the, the just, I've yet to meet a spider girl fan who didn't like the character for the right reasons. You know, because we didn't play up her sexuality. We didn't draw her like a Jim Lee girl or anything like that. You know, we didn't draw her like an Adam Hughes girl. Uh, she was just a good kid. You know, I mean, she did the right thing because it was the right thing to do. And we get, I, I, every fan I've met of Spider Girl is genuinely a neat person, a good person that they like Spider Girl because she, because she represented that. You know, she represented decent people at a time when some of the books in the 90s were getting a little dark and a little violent and over-sexualized and everything. Spider Girl was a nice little throwback title that you could show to kids, you know, and, and young kids were reading it. I, when it went into those digests yeah. through the, through the you know, Scholastic and stuff, we were, at one point, we were told that as long as we're selling the digest through Scholastic, your job is secure because we're going to need, they're selling like hotcakes and we're going to need new material to fill the digests. Unfortunately, shortly after they said that, Scholastic wanted a bigger cut. Oh. And, Mar and Marvel said, screw you. And they stopped producing the digests. That's so unfortunately, bad. not only did we lose those sales, but we lost that audience. You know, hopefully some of that audience came over and continued to read the book. I don't know. But, you know, that's the thing. I mean, I heard stories from every quarter that you know, there were girls going into comic shops after they saw the Spider-Man movie, the first Spider-Man movie mm -hmm. with Tobey Maguire. And they were looking for books about Mary Jane because that was the girl and the, and the thing, right? And then when they found out there was a Spider Girl, they were thrilled, you know? So I'm sure that's why Spider Gwen resonates and, uh, you know, and some of these other characters do as well. Like so. Uh, because people want, you know, girls, girls like to read comics too, but they like to read comics about girls. Why wouldn't they, you know? But I think because Tom and I were, 
respectful of the character and uh, you know really liked Mayday, that I think we did a good job creating a character like with Eric. I mean, yeah. it blows my mind, Doy, that that Thunderstrike was only being it was only printed for two years. It, was, it only ran for twenty four issues. Twenty four issues, yeah. Twenty some years ago, okay, probably more now, thirty years ago, and I still. At every convention I do, I have at least like a half dozen or a dozen people come up to me and say, Eric is my favorite character of all time. Can you do me a sketch of Thunderstrike? Or can you sign my Thunderstrikes or whatever? I mean, after all these years, he's because the sales were, like I said, the sales were great. I mean, he was very popular. But after all these years, people still remember Eric. And, and I think the only thing that DeFalco and I do right is that if we're enthusiastic and if we're having fun, I think the readers have fun. And certainly in characters that we created from the ground up, like Eric and like Mayday, those characters reflect that. You know, they're, they're people you don't mind hanging out with, hanging out with for the 15 or 20 minutes that it takes to read a comic book, you know? And you wanna buy the next issue because you wanna see what's going on with them. That's why I would buy Spider-Man when I was a kid yeah. I, I, Pete was my friend. I wanted to know what happens to Peter Parker next issue, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think that's one of the things we did right with those characters. And, uh, and I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that the fans like them and, uh, and that they still like them. Uh, it's, it's very humbling, you know, that we, anytime you have a success, anytime, you know, I wish those books were still being published, but even that they're even the fact that they're not, I mean, the fact that they're fondly remembered by the fan base and that new fans are discovering them all the time, that's that's really cool. That's really cool. I mean, this thing with Thor Ragnarok, where there's shots of him with a sleeveless vest on, and everybody's going, Oh, they're gonna do Thunderstrike, and they're not gonna do Thunderstrike. Come on, they're not gonna do Thunderstrike. But it was interesting to me. That it went that direction. That they, that every website was doing was showing pictures of Thunderstrike and all this kind of stuff, you know. And it's like, well, I'm glad he's not forgotten, you know, because a lot of people, they they who a lot of people who didn't read the book no, think he was like a lame ripoff character. But the people who read the book know that Eric was his own guy, you know. I mean, he he was a lot more than just a lame ripoff character. So, um. I think with with Spider Girl, you guys really did hit that sweet spot because I'm personally a guy who who does not prefer Peter married to to Mary Jane. I I like it in the regular stories when he's when he's dating around because I think it's hilarious and funny and terrible for him. I like it when bad things happen to Peter Parker. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's that that used to. Uh, I always felt that's how you write a Spider Man story <laughs> is you you make a list of all the crappy things that can happen to a human being. <laughs> and you check off the ones that have already happened. I mean, our original plan before Jim Shooter and Stan Lee got involved was we were going to take Mary, he and Mary Jane to the altar, but he was going to get left at the altar. Mary <laughs> Jane. That would have yeah. been the best. Because that was, you know, that was one of the crappy things that hadn't happened to him yet. You know, right? we, we were ultimately what we were planning, but we were going to let it play out over years and we wouldn't have gotten fired off of Spider-Man. Uh, you know, we had a we had a slow burn plan where he and Mary Jane were going to you know, reignite their relationship and they were going to start dating and they were going to get engaged and it was going to go very much the way it did go. But we, we had already set up the backstory with Mary Jane and her sister. Yeah. And uh, in, in our idea, uh, Mary Jane's sister wasn't living in Pittsburgh, but she was living out on the West Coast. And at some point, you know, Mary Jane was going to be having second thoughts about, is this a good idea, marrying Spider-Man, you know, that kind of thing. And at that time, her sister gets a hold of her and offers her a chance to reconcile. And mm -hmm. she has a chance to put her family back together. And she tries to get a hold of Pete. She try, keeps trying to call Pete, but Pete's he's out fighting. He's out fighting the Sinister Six or something, you know. And he finally finishes that battle just in time to get home, put on his rented tux and run to the church. And by the time he gets to the church, Harry is going to be his best man. And, you know, we see a silent sequence where he runs up the steps and Harry meets him at the church door and gives him back the ring. 
and oh. and walks away and Pete's standing there and we were going to do an epilogue where Pete's moving he decides to move back in with uh, Aunt May wow you guys and, had that planned out yeah we well it's we had had discussions about it yeah but we we were going to we were planning on having him move back in with Aunt May and live in the attic he was going to turn the attic into an apartment so he could come and go mm. more easily and all this kind of stuff so he was going to move back in with Aunt May and while he's moving in in this epilogue, he's moving boxes up the stairs and all this kind of stuff. And the phone rings and Aunt May answers the phone and it's Mary Jane. And Mary Jane says, May, can I please speak to Peter? And Aunt May's got her little boy back. Aunt May is very upset with Mary Jane because she broke his heart and she's got her little boy back. So she says, there's nobody here that wants to speak to you, young lady. Oh, wow. And May, please. And she goes, goodbye, Mary Jane. And she hangs up the phone. And Pete comes on the steps. He goes, who was on the phone, Aunt May? Goes, it was no one, Peter. No one you need to be concerned with. And that was going to be our new status quo for a while, you know. Uh, but then Stan decided he was going to marry them in the strip. Yeah. And Shooter decided that was a great idea for the books, too. And Jim Ousley fired our asses off Spider-Man. So none of it happened you ever see that piece jim owsley wrote around 10 years ago where he apologized oh, to everyone oh i've seen that piece and i've heard everybody quoting that piece and and it's his version of uh, glenn greenberg who yeah. was one of our editors at marvel he did a piece for back issue magazine back issue magazine he did a big piece called when when hobby met spidey or when Spidey met Hobby or something like that. He does an entire uh, uh, essay on what happened during that period of time on the Spider-Man titles, okay? And he interviews Peter David, and he interviews Tom DeFalco, and he interviews me, and he interviews... Danny Fingeroth? Of... I'm sorry? Danny Fingeroth? Or... Yeah, Danny Fingeroth. He interviewed Shooter, he interviewed a whole bunch of people. And he used, he, could, he couldn't get a hold of Ousley, but he used Ausley's blog as Ausley's testimony, basically, right? And nobody else's version of what happened lines up with Ausley's. Peter David had conversations with Ausley that do not line up with what Ausley wrote. Shooter does not remember anything like what Ausley wrote. Um, I, I do think, I mean, from what, I've, from what I understand in, in these more recent years, uh, and even in that essay, uh, Ousley admits that he was overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and frankly, we all knew that. Um, Jim Shooter broke all of his rules for hiring an editor when he hired Jim Ousley. Okay. Jim Ousley's a terrific writer. He deserves all the accolades he gets as a writer. Mm -hmm. And Jim was impressed with him. Okay. And Jim made him the editor of the Spider-Man titles, even though he had never edited anything before. Okay. It's a huge now, Jim's assignment. Jim, Jim's policy was always you hire your editor and then you back off and let them edit. Okay. But he always hired editors with experience. The reason he broke that rule with Owsley is because he saw a lot of potential in Owsley. And this was his argument. His argument was. There's no way the kid can fail because I put him on the Spider-Man titles. Tom DeFalco's writing amazing. He's an ex-editor. He was executive editor at the time. Louise Jones was writing Web of Spider-Man. She was an ex-editor. And Al Milgram was writing Peter Parker. He's an ex-editor. So there's no way the kid can fail. He's working with three experienced editors, right? But then the first thing Osley does is he fired Louise Jones and he fired Al Milgram. And then ultimately he fired the Falco. So it was a, it was just a train wreck from day one. I mean, he was completely overwhelmed. He, I, I don't know. I mean, no he, idea what he was doing. What he made a lot of, he made a lot of bad decisions. And I, I don't doubt that he felt pressure from shooter and the shooter had his own agenda because shooter was sending the Falco to England a lot. And, you know, as his executive editor, he was, he was expecting a lot of DeFalco, 
But I'm going to tell you this. The Falco never once missed a deadline, ever. To this day. I, was, I might have been a screw up, but the Falco has never missed a deadline in his life. So there's no wow. way in hell the Falco deserved to be fired, ever. Ever. But, you know, because we, at one point, um, Jim Ashley flew into Pittsburgh on the, on the company's dime and took Tom and I to a really nice restaurant on the company's dime and handed us this schedule that we had to meet to get Spider-Man where he wanted it to be. And within a couple of weeks, within a month or so, we met it. Then he gave us another schedule that said we were still late and we tried to meet that and all this kind of, but when we were fired, Marie Severin, who was, Marie, not Marie Severin, I'm sorry, Virginia Ramita, who was the traffic manager, who was in charge of the schedules. When she heard we were fired, she went into DeFalco's office and she said, what the hell's going on on the Spider-Man titles? And he goes, you're going to have to ask Ousley. I don't know what the hell's going on. She goes, well, Tom, he said he fired you because you were late. You're the most on time of anybody in the office. I use you as the, I use you as the club to beat the other guys over the head with. And Tom said, I don't know what to tell you, Virginia. The shooter came in and said, what the hell's happening on the books? He goes, go talk to Jim Owsley. You hired him. Go talk to him. It was awful. Wow. It was awful. Just Tom DeFalco gets fired for the worst reasons. Yes. Yeah. You know what he gets fired for the most? Being right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what he gets. They could just say thank you, but instead they fire him. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Because that, that's the thing. That's two instances later, now. <laughs> years later, Tom heard that, I, I don't know, I don't know, I might be getting some of the facts wrong, and I apologize if I do. But years later, DeFalco heard that Jim Osley was like driving a bus or something like that. And he felt bad because he's a good writer. So DeFalco rehired him as a writer. You know, and DeFalco didn't buy bear a grudge or he wasn't, you know, I mean, the one thing we did is right after we, when we first started on Thor, yeah. we had a character in Thor named Aloysius James Lee, oh. who was a thinly veiled Jim Owsley clone. He was a, a building designer. He was an architect. Yeah. And we had him, he was always talking about his vision and how he was going to tear everything down and start over and all this kind of stuff. So it really wasn't all that mean spirited. It was, you know, it was all in good fun. But a lot of people think it was kind of, you know, kind of mean to do it or something like that. But, you know, hell, he still had a job when we did that. <laughs> I mean, we were lucky to get Thor after, uh, after that. I mean, after I was fired off of Spider-Man, the only I mean, thing I had going for me I had a, a Punisher graphic novel with uh, with Joe Duffy that I was supposed to do, and I knew I couldn't do it. It was um, it was called the Assassins Guild. It was ultimately done by uh, Jorge Safino, yeah. who did a fantastic job with it. It involved the yakuza and mobs and all this kind of stuff. So I knew I couldn't do a proper job with it, and I was I was wrecked. I I lost my confidence. I lost. Uh, I you know it was tough. I mean, if you lose you lose your job on Spider Man. There's worse places to land than, th you no know, Jack well, Kirby. It, it was it was a few months. There was a few months there where I thought I'm gonna have to go get a real job. <laughs> this, this really sucks. I'm gonna have to get a real job. But I mean, Jack um, Kirby's store after Walt Simonson. Well, they uh, what it, what ended up happening was the the the, the jobs that I got first after that dead period because I sent that gra I sent the script for the graphic novel back. And I got, I, I got a real lecture from Carl Potts, who was the editor on that. And he, mm. I think it was Carl. It was either Carl or Larry Hama. I'm pretty sure it was Carl Potts. He read me the riot act. He, he told me a lot of things that I deserved to hear. That it was very unprofessional and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so Yo, I was pretty. Needs to hear. So I was pretty crushed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then the the first gigs that came in were. Ralph Macchio offered me the fill-in Thor uh, with the Falco that was the Secret Wars 2 tie-in. It was that first issue of Thor we did, 383 yeah. or whatever it was. And Mike Carlin called with that first Superman annual, that uh, Titano Superman annual. And Brett Breeding inked both of them. It was hallelujah. I felt like I was back. I was getting my, slowly getting my confidence back. We originally were doing um, 
the two Thor fillings to impress Roger, uh, to uh, Ralph Macchio. I'm sorry, to impress Ralph Macchio because we were we were uh, 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 campaigning to get Daredevil uh, oh, after wow. after Frank Miller. After Frank, yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what we were. That's why we were pitching. And I did like a pinup of Daredevil for Ralph, and you know Tom wanted to get back to you know, street level crime and he liked writing street level characters. So we thought we could parlay our Spider-Man run into some Daredevil stuff. Uh, but after we did the two fill-ins, Ralph said, I have a book for you too. And Tom went, Daredevil. And he went, no, Thor. <laughs> and Tom went, but I can't write, I don't want to write cosmic. I can't write cosmic. And Ralph <laughs> yeah, said, you, you, just, you just did two issues. Of course you can. And Tom being Tom, he uh, threw himself in on the deep end. He deliberately dove into the deep end with the uh, what he introduced, the, the Celtic gods and Seth's god war and the celestials. You know, that was all the way like, in the first three, four issues. We were doing celestial stories. So he, he wanted to prove to himself, either I can write this stuff or I can't. Let's find out immediately. I was going to say, like, the first thing he does is introduce all of these new pantheons. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he but... introduced the pantheon and we started the, the Seth stuff. We started the subplot of all this, the, the, uh, the war of the pantheons. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then we went right into the three part celestial story. And that was Tom testing himself. That was Tom seeing if he could write cosmic, if he could enjoy writing cosmic. And if he could, great. And if he couldn't, okay. It, uh, yeah. Ori originally, the the celestial was only going to be two parts, but then he came up, he came up with the cliffhanger of the giant foot coming down, of uh, of Arishem judging yeah. the planet, and then the giant foot coming down next to Arishem. He came up with that visual, and he said, "Okay, that's got to be a cliffhanger. So we're going to go three issues on this thing." And he restructured it, went three issues. And I was a great story. I love that story. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's interesting that you said you wanted to work on Daredevil because one of the things that you guys did was Gang War, which is. Yeah, we in... actually we actually left right at the beginning of that. Yeah, we were fired right at the beginning of that. Yeah. But I just thought it was interesting the way Marvel used to work, you know, because it's just that was an offshoot of born again right right so yeah, yeah I, don't I mean think they, we see that I kind mean, of interaction anymore between titles we probably we probably would have gone a little lighter with daredevil um my favorite daredevil stories were always the ones that played up the dare more than the devil mm -hmm. uh so and, and frank had kind of left him there you know frank and uh uh david mazzicelli thank you david mazzicelli left left him with that that final splash page of him walking hand in hand with karen and the sun was coming up over hell's kitchen and everything was great and and we thought that this would be a great time for our point of view you know to have matt feeling a little better about what he's doing and not be so grim and 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 get back to some of that uh some of the stuff like from the ramita run and the gene colon run you know and have him uh be a little more uh, a little lighter of a character uh, which was where we would have gone with it, but uh, but Anne Nascenti came on and did a terrific run with yeah. J.R. Jr. and you know the, the rest. Well, actually, who was hired after that? Was that maybe? It, it was I think it was. I think it was Anne and because uh, Denny was in between the two Frank runs. Oh, was he? Okay, so okay. I think it was Anne yeah. and Jr. Yeah, Jr. so I guess Anne and Jr. came on. So you can't argue with that. I mean, yeah. you know, they did some great stuff. So. Mr. Rod, friends, you were saying that, um, you know, it may not have been planned, but you ended up working on a lot of variations of these classic yes. characters. Yeah. You, would, you created, you know, you worked on uh, Mayday Parker for, yeah. for, a, the long, for a very long time. How do you feel about, uh, you know, current comics? You know, that's basically a standard plot now. And how do you feel about fans just not you know th that faction of fans were always resistant to such changes well i'm gonna have to cop out on you there because yeah. i haven't read any regular runs for a long time i i lurk on message boards and on facebook pages and i i have a, a vague sense of what's going on in some of the books right now but i i really i'm not reading the current okay. stuff 
So I, anything I would say would just be self-serving and, and uninformed. <laughs> so this so is where I, you I, say I, I did it better. <laughs> I, that's that's yeah. always that's but that's always a subjective call too. You know, I mean, one man one man's uh, gold is another man's garbage. So uh, you know, uh, I you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that I'm sure I would enjoy, but there's a lot of stuff that. I mean, unfortunately, what I what I do see is this tendency now where creators don't want to create for for the companies. They don't want to create for Marvel and DC because they don't want to create anything that they don't have that they're not going to benefit from. So you see a lot of recycled ideas. I mean, like I understand Thor is in the Destroyer again, and you know it's it's like well yeah that was really cool when Walt did it. You know, 30 years ago, you know, that kind of thing. Are you going to do something new with it? I mean, when Jane Foster lifted the hammer and became Thor, people would come up to me with like this attitude and go, you never would have done that with Tom. I said, you're talking to the guy who did Eric. <laughs> you did Eric. Yeah. I mean, yes, we, <laughs> if we would have thought of that, yes, we would have done it. We, we probably would have come up with a different name for her. We probably wouldn't have called her Thor, you know, but yeah, I could easily see us of doing that with, with Jane Foster. Why the hell not? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, the only argument against it was was all the way back from that Kirby story where she failed the trial of the gods, where she, you know, she freaked <laughs> out and, and kind of peed herself and, and got sent home by Odin, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. Uh, so that does exactly speak to somebody that's going to be worthy. But then things had really changed for her by then too. I mean, she was battling cancer and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, I, what I heard about that storyline, I thought was very compelling. You know, and I'm curious to see what they do with it in the in the movie. Yeah, in the movie. You know, we'll, see. we'll see. And of course, everybody's telling me Thunderstrike's going to show up. You know, that Eric's going to become Thunder or uh, Thor's going to become Thunderstrike, or they're going to make the Thunderstrike mace. And everybody's asking me, "How do you feel about that?" And I'm like, "One, I don't think it's going to happen," and two. It's way above my pay grade. I, I have no idea. So yeah, I see people because uh, Walt Simonson has a has a group on Facebook, and I see people yeah. complaining about about Jane Foster as Thor, saying like nobody should be worthy to lift a hammer. I was like, you're saying this in a Walt Simonson fan yeah, you're group. You're saying this to the guy who who broke the mold. I mean, he's the one that did Beta Ray Bill. I mean, if anybody's if anybody is directly responsible for Eric Masterson and everybody else that's lifted the hammer, it's Walt. You know? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but that's that goes back to the fans that you were talking about. So yeah, some guy. Well, I mean, it, it breaks my heart when I hear people bitch about the movies because you know, yeah, the movies are different from the comics. And if you're going to be that set that if it's not a direct adaptation of the comic, you hate it and you think it's shit, then you're just cheating yourself out of some fun because. I, I enjoy the hell out of these movies. I've, I've been enjoying the hell out of the movies. I've been enjoying the hell out of the Disney Plus series. I loved uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I thought that was terrific. I'm enjoying Loki. I thought, I, I just think some of the stories they're telling, like WandaVision and everything, are just incredible. I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, relax, have fun with it. I mean, you know, why would you want them to do a direct word for word adaptation? of a comic book that you've read 30 times I already so, have that. That you know every, so that you know everything's going to happen you know why would you want to know everything that's going to happen in the movie I, I don't understand that reason you know i agree you see the latest episode of loki with classic yeah. loki in it with classic loki and did you see did you catch the little easter egg with the uh, frog, frog in the jar and everything? Yeah. yeah it was wonderful and the Thanos copter, that was Thanos the one copter. that got me. I laughed out loud when I saw that. Yeah. It's like, oh, Thanos copter. That, that was fantastic, yeah. So yeah. tell me about Heroes Union. Heroes Union is going to be, you know, as as you can probably tell from this conversation we've just had, uh, I enjoy a certain kind of comic book. I enjoy a fun comic with action and adventure and human characters and, you know, the characters are allowed to have feet of clay, but basically they're good people who are trying to do the right thing. And you will meet a whole lot of characters like that in the Heroes Union. Uh, Darren Henry, who has created Blue Baron and Startup and all of these characters, um, he has been growing this organically from the beginning. But this is a great jumping on point for 
the distribution through Dynant. Okay, he's been test marketing these books for the last couple of years in Central PA and in some uh, in limited comic shops. But this is the first national, international distribution of these books. So we're, this is brand new, The Heroes Union, written by Roger Stern, penciled by me, inked by Sal Basema and a young guy named Chris Nye, and uh, colored by Glenn Whitmore, lettered by Marshall Dillon, a gentleman named Marshall Dillon. And he, everybody does a great job. It's a real professional looking package. It's a fun story. It is 60, I think 64, 64 pages. pages. For for three ninety nine, four ninety nine. Is sorry. it also oversized? No, no. Okay. It's, it's regular comic size. It will be square bound, however. Oh, and it's going to be fun. I mean, it you know it it's it's going to be fun. You're going to meet a bunch of characters that may or may not become your new favorite character. You're going to pay the same price that you would for a regular comic, but get three times the story. That's three. I had two for a second. That's three. <laughs> Three times the story for the same price. It's going to be fun. I, I guarantee if you like comics, especially if you like Marvel comics, if you like the Marvel movies, yeah. give it a shot. Give it a try. You know, it's, it's, it's $4.99 and it's going to be a hell of a ride. And I hope as many people as possible join us on it because uh, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. And the characters themselves are going to be starring in their own titles that'll be out through uh, diamond as well. And uh, there's a, I, I get a lot of offers, especially from independent creators. And Darren was one of the guys that contacted me and what he was taught. He's a child of seventies Marvel. Right. Yeah. And that's the, those are the kind of comics that he wanted to do. And I, I thought, well, that's certainly in my wheelhouse. And he originally wanted to hire Sal Buscema, the pencil and ink, the, his character, the Blue yeah. Baron. And Sal at that point was kind of retired from actually storytelling, you know, from doing interiors and stuff. So he wasn't really interested in penciling it, but he said, you know, if you, you, why don't you call Ron Friends? If Ron Friends does it, I'll ink it. And uh, so that's how I got the gig. And uh, Darren and I set about creating these characters. I mean, he, he has a lot, he had a lot of great ideas and he would send me, you know, this disparate reference of costume ideas and things. And, and my job was to kind of take them and blend them and, and put them all together into something that looked like it belonged together, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I love these characters. I, I think they're a lot of fun. Roger Stern did a wonderful job coming in with these characters and, uh, and continuing with, with, Darren has uh, has started with uh, the characterizations and the voices. I, you know, like I said, I I can't think of a better way. If you're a comics fan, I can't think of a better way to spend four ninety nine to see if you like it. You know, to give it a yeah. shot. So uh, unfortunately, the orders have already closed through Diamond. So you're going to have to we're going to have to rely on you know call your local call lo local comic shop, see if they've ordered any. If they haven't, ask them if they can still re, uh, mm -hmm. get, get a second wave of orders and uh, and go from there. But uh, I'm going to be doing some shop appearances here locally around Pittsburgh to, to help launch the book. It comes out August 4th, that Wednesday. And uh, I, I, if you like comics that are fun, okay? I keep using the word fun because I want, I like comics that are fun to read. I don't, I, you know, it, sometimes it's good to read a comic that makes you think. Mm -hmm. And this one will actually make you think. This has some really yeah. interesting science fiction ideas. I hear this is also going to be educational. Well, well, yeah. Uh, it's, well, a lot of the characters, which I thought were really interesting from the very beginning, his characters are based on business terms, right? Like Blue Baron, Startup, Bull is one of the characters, uh, Windfall. Uh, you know, there's a villain called the bank, you know, there, there's, so, so they're all based on like Wall Street terminology. Yeah. And, and, and it's one, it's just a clever idea that you don't, it's not oppressive. You don't really notice it with every character, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but there will be a, a glossary in the back that will explain, you know, what he's doing and everything. So it could be a fun way to teach kids 
about some of these business terms and everything. But my biggest concern is that it's just going to be entertaining for these kids. It's also going to be the first book in 10 or 15 years that's going to carry the Comics Code Authority stamp. Wow. Now, now the Comics Code Authority, that, that trademark is now owned by the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Okay. Okay. And Roger uh, co-plotted the story with Darren Henry before we knew we were going to get the stamp. Roger scripted it before we knew we were going to get the stamp. I penciled it before we knew we were going to get the stamp. Sal inked it before we knew we were going to get the stamp. But to my knowledge, not a single thing was asked to be changed to get the stamp. So it's not, it's not about embracing censorship or anything like that. What it's about is that if that Comics Code Authority stamp on our book makes one involved parent feel better about buying it for her kid, then I am all for it. I hope they read the book together. I hope they get some new characters, they get new favorite characters out of it. And I hope they tell their friends, you know. So I see a lot of talk on Facebook about, you know, censorship and everything. If you, for a minute, let me talk about it. The, the, the Comics Code Authority was never more than an internal industry board mm -hmm. that to survive what uh, uh, Wortham uh, yeah. during the Kefauver hearings, okay, with all that poor stuff that put, that put the EC books out of business. And let's be honest, the EC books were pretty, pretty horrible for kids, you know, that kind of thing. So DC and Marvel and the other publishers at the time decided, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to create this Comics Code Authority that will be an internal censorship board where we'll come up with our own standards, we'll publish those standards, we'll let people know what those standards are, and then we come up with a stamp, and if the parents see the stamp, they'll know that it's not going to have horrible murder and death like the EC comics did, basically, right? But the thing was... As, as societal attitudes changed, as, you know, as, as different, uh, different reasoning came about, like Stan published two issues of Spider-Man without the stamp yeah. because the government asked him to do those drug issues, right? At that time, the code was against showing any kind of drug use. They changed it. The guys got together at a meeting and they said, okay, we're going to change this. Things are changing. If we want to do responsible stories about the evils of drug use, we're going to have to allow drug use. You know, of course. Uh, Roy Th Roy Thomas found a way against uh, around the no no vampires, no werewolves thing by doing Morbius and Manwolf, which were scientific based monsters, yeah. right? And when the code saw that, they went, you know what? That's stupid. Why are we afraid of vampires and werewolves? That's, so they started doing vampires and werewolves. And the next thing you knew, we had Tomb of Dracula and Werewolf by Night and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was always an internal thing. It was just basically the industry agreeing that we can't be showing wholesale slaughter in the books if we're going to still try to sell these to kids, right? Yeah. These days... I, the industry, the, the audience has aged so much that, I mean, is anybody really thinking about selling to kids anymore? I think That's we should still thing, be thinking yeah. about selling to kids. Kids are going to see the Marvel movies. The Marvel movies are PG. They're going to see the Marvel movies and loving them. And yet we're still doing stuff that they're not going to, it's not going to appeal to kids. You know, we're at, at binge books. We're going to do stories that appeal like Stan Lee's stories did. They're going to appeal to kids of all ages, you know, kids from six to 60. And uh, we're going to try to get back to that. We're going to try to do to to entertain the widest possible audience we can. So the, 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 the best comparison I can make are the Marvel films right now. You know, uh, we're going to do superhero stories that are human and show characters with feet of clay and characters that doubt themselves and characters that worry about the rent and characters that worry about paying the bills. But they're also characters who are genuinely interested in doing the right thing. They're characters you're going to like hanging around with. So that's my pitch. And with great art. Uh, and and I, I mean, it's what, what I've said on a couple of interviews, it's kind of my lead line. If nothing else, you're going to pay 4 dollars 
for a comic done by trained professionals <laughs> who know what they're doing. So you may not like it, but it will be professionally done. <laughs> it won't be bad. You may not like it, but it won't be bad. Roger Stern, Ron Friends, and Sal Buscema, everyone. There you go. Heroes Union, August 4. August 4th, yep. Thank you so much, but, Mr. Friend. Okay. And yeah. listen, I, I, I really appreciate you spending time letting me talk about that, but I've enjoyed our conversation. Today. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, thanks for, uh, for keeping me out there in front of the audience. See, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm 61. But I'm a lie. <laughs> Mr. Friend, Mr. Ron Friends, one of the greatest Spider-Man artists of all time, one of the greatest Thor artists of all time. Just I really I appreciate that, man. But time. thank you. That's silly. But thank you very much. It's, it's true. Who would you put above who would you put above you? That's not Everybody. Steve Ditko, John Ramita. Well, there's two. John Basema and Sal Basema, you know. Um, uh, Keith Pollard. For, Keith Pollard. I liked Keith's stuff better than mine. I wouldn't so. put Keith Pollard above you, sir. I'm just well. See, now we're gonna have to fight, <laughs> as fans do. As fans do. As fans do. It's Thank great. You. It's been great spending time with you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much.